All right. Hey, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Um, all right. So why don't we recap where we last what, uh, left off? We're talking about constrained language mode, which is the enforcement mechanism that PowerShell uses when AppLocker and Defender Application Control are in enforcement mode. Um, I covered the rough methodology that I use to uncover potentially uh, vulnerable signed scripts. And we discussed ways in which uh, we can influence uh, potential injection vulnerabilities. So one of our primary targets was trying to find a way to inject arbitrary unsigned C-sharp code into a call to add type in a script that is Windows signed. And we were successful with injecting C sharp code into one of the scripts in the C Windows Diagnostics directory. Only it was discovered that it likely is not exploitable um, almost by luck because there was environment variable injection. But because the same environment variable was used multiple times, there was no real obvious way to inject and properly close out uh, proper C-sharp code through our injection. So I'm pretty confident Microsoft got lucky in this case. Um, it does remain vulnerable, um, but I'm not too worried about it. Um, at the end of the day, uh, having found a ton of constrained language mode bypasses and reporting all of them to Microsoft, Seeing them turn around fixes and recommended uh, mitigations um, has been really heartening um, to me, and it has only served to increase my confidence in the robustness of this um, uh, serviceable security feature. So what do I mean by service serviceable security feature? I mean, if you find a bug in constrained language mode enforcement, report it to MSRC, secure at Microsoft.com. And uh, if it's a good enough bug, then you'll get a pretty handsome bounty as a result. Um, so I, I kind of got on a soapbox last time when discussing like when a customer approaches you inquiring about, hey, I'm worried about PowerShell quote exploitation. Um, how do I block PowerShell? Um, so the summary of my perspective of that is, well, one, it's not exploitation. You are already owned in the first place. So the attacker just happened to use PowerShell as their preferred post-exploitation language, which uh, depending on your perspective, like could actually be a great silver lining because if you have proper logging and in this case, uh, mitigations like constrained language mode in place, then you're getting amazing logging and you're capturing all the context of the, uh, in this case, the attempted attack. Um, so in my opinion, blocking PowerShell, if you actually understand what PowerShell actually is, which is not just PowerShell.exe, um, I don't believe to be a worthwhile effort. Um, if you're going through the effort to block PowerShell malware, then what efforts are you going through to block C++, Rust, JScript, VBScript, ComScriptlet malware, right? Like PowerShell's got you covered. We would be so fortunate if in an assume breach uh, scenario, the attacker chose to use PowerShell and we had great logging for it. All right, anyway, so let's get started with um, the content for today. I was going to discuss um, my WDAC tools PowerShell module. And we've looked at some of the code from this module a little bit already. So let's give ourselves a refresher on what functionality is included here. Okay. So we get these things here. What we've used fairly extensively when auditing our uh, WDAC policies in audit and enforcement mode 
has been get wdac code integrity event, right? So just like as a refresher, the rough workflow that I used was the following. Like if I was only interested in user mode events, I would do tack user. If I was only interested in events that occurred since the last time I set or refreshed the policy, it's as easy as that. So it'll go through, um, parse out the event log, and there are some kind of like esoteric. Oh, you, you lost audio? Are, are you able to hear me, Sonny? Can you hear me? Anyone? Can you hear me? Okay. Hey, Brian. So, okay, well, Brian can hear me, so uh, Sonny, hopefully you can get all that worked out. Cool. Hey, Jeffrey. Thanks for chiming in, too. Good to see you. Uh, so anyway, uh, WDAC code integrity event will um, go through the event log and parse out some of the more, like, esoteric um, event fields. For example, um, it's not clear in the event log when something is enforced versus audited. And so I, I do you a favor and, and parse that out for you. Um, there's some other ones that are relatively esoteric that aren't, um, that are escaping me. Oh yeah, like the, some of the signer information is kind of weird um, and doesn't give you a lot of context. Um, this is also a feature that I support in WDAC code integrity event. Um, by default, it won't pull correlated signer information um, just because it's not like super performant um, with how that correlation is performed, or at least I don't know a super performant way to do it. Um, but we can we can pull that information back if we wanted to to get uh, corresponding signer information. Okay. Um, so that's what we've used the most thus far in the WDAC tools module. And I use it all the time, like I love it. Um, but that really is just a small subset of everything that is available to you. So uh, other auditing related functionality that we looked briefly at was get, w get WDAC app locker script MSI event. Um, and as a refresher, uh, when WDAC is in audit mode or enforcement mode, any uh, portable executable files that are loaded and like logged, if they don't uh, meet the policy, go to the uh, Microsoft Code Integrity event log. So that's, again, just PE files. So EXEs, DLLs, device drivers, whatnot. Everything else, uh, so think anything like script related or like MSIs is actually logged in the app locker log. Okay. So I, I have a, a different, different function to, to pull that information back and the, and the event fields in, in the app locker log are a little bit different. So that's why I, I couldn't like realistically combine the two auditing functions. So you, you get a little bit of information here, which, which is helpful. Um, so there's that. Uh, what else do we have? Um, I don't think I ever showed this to you. Convert to WDAC code integrity policy. So we've used this a bunch. Convert from CI policy to take a WDAC code integrity XML policy and convert it to a binary form. What if we're an attacker or what if we're responsible for deploying this and and we we lost our original copy of si policy.p7b and we wanted to have an opportunity to to recover that. Unfortunately, Microsoft does not supply us with this <laughs> as lovely as that would be to take um, a binary policy file like si policy.p7b and recover it back to uh, an XML. Um, but I got you covered. So 
you give it binary file path. We'll do C windows system 32 code integrity, SI policy.p7b. Um, this will also parse uh, CIP files. So in a previous stream, I covered uh, multiple policies and those take on the following forms. Okay. Oh man, Jeffrey. <laughs> Jeffrey saying the existence of, of this function uh, is one of the reasons that Microsoft uh, hasn't bothered yet with <laughs> including that uh, in, in the OS. Uh, I, I have feelings about this that, that I will uh, spare everyone. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, well, I, I guess I will harp on it just, just briefly, um, just the, the, the maintenance burden required. So like whenever Microsoft does update the, the XML schema, like I have to go through the effort of reverse engineering the .NET code. Well, I mean, it's not, it's .NET code. So arguably like it's not really re reverse engineering, but I have to go through all that code and kind of like reverse out what the um, the binary format is supposed to look like and update my code accordingly whenever those schema changes do occur, which aren't like really announced. Um, so I just kind of have to proactively seek out those schema changes, go into the code, uh, decompile it, and then um, update things accordingly. Um, I kind of have a, like a workflow um, built out for it now, but um, you know, it just it, it's a pain, but it, it works nicely. So I'm going to take this SIP file, this binary um, policy file, and then I'll just, um, we'll just call it foo.xml. It's okay, Jeffrey. <laughs> oh, well, um, yeah, that's true. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll come back to this uh, because I didn't... Uh, I didn't think to include this as part of the policy to allow execution because th this uses all kinds of like .NET um, APIs to recover the XML. So per my current policy, it's not going to be allowed to execute under the confines of constraint language mode. Um, but the meat of what I wanted to show you all today is in uh, the new WDAC policy configuration and invoke WDAC code integrity policy build functions. All right, so this function, uh, the new dash function, is what we use to specify options for code integrity policies in code versus in XML. So I'll show you what that means in, in a little bit. And then once we specify in code what we want our multiple policies to look like, then we can build it all and deploy it using the invoke WDAC code integrity policy build function. All right. So let's start to make sense of all of this. Now, um, let me just refer you to the documentation uh, that I have in in my GitHub. Um, <laughs> let me first highlight the, the caveat, big caveat here. And this is one of the like motivations for doing these streams in the first place is you need to understand how to work with code integrity policies, specifically multiple code integrity policies and like supplemental policies in the first place. If you want to have any level of comfort using W uh, the WDAC tools, module for configuration and, and deployment. Um, so, um, yep. So we'll, um, yeah, we'll get that caveat over with and you're, you're all experts now at, at this point anyway. So, um, you should be able to follow along nicely. Okay. Um, there are some things to be aware of when you're prepping your XML policies, and I've got that uh, all documented here. So specifically, we're not going to define any uh, policy rules. So for example, like if you want to specify that your policy is going to be in audit mode, 
nope, we're not going to put any of that stuff in our XML policy because we're going to specify all of that in code because it will lend itself to a more repeatable and auditable process, in my opinion. I don't like having to work with XML directly or via the commandlets to inject options into um, my XML policy, okay? Um, and also, you can have a policy info uh, name and ID. This can be whatever you want it to be. Like you can name it whatever, um, and it will surface in the event log under policy name and policy ID. So I like to supply a name of my choosing, and then what uh, what the, the module will do is, by default, I have it just insert the, the current um, uh, month, day, and year uh, into the policy ID, just so that you can have like a good indication of like when, when an event fires, you'll know when that policy was built through the event log. So it's convenient for me, so I included that functionality in there. So um, we need to have replace me in there and then the code will know, like if replace me is in there, then it knows to replace that properly, okay? And um, because I don't ever have this stuff um, down to memory, I've included uh, in the examples directory an example uh, for how to build a policy. And so we're gonna work with this and just really just uh, edit this a little bit um, for our policy. But let's, um, let's go back and make sense. Uh, let's make sense of what we would like to allow. So in the very first stream, we built our default Windows policy. And it's relatively straightforward. We took it from um, the template uh, C Windows schemas code integrity directory and we incorporated this in, into our policy, right? So we absolutely want to allow Windows signed code to run, okay? So that's number one, we need to take care of that. Number two, we want, uh, because we're allowing Windows signed code to execute, we're potentially opening, our, opening ourselves up to danger, right? So with things like MS Build, for example, which is built into the OS, it's Windows signed, and happens to allow arbitrary unsigned code execution in a fashion that is not subject to code integrity enforcement. As is the case with many of these other um, listed files in this uh, block list, which Microsoft also uh, provides for you. So we want to incorporate this into our policy. And then uh, I forget which stream it was. I think it was the second stream. When we started to get into user mode enforcement, um, that's when we built out the like application specific policies. So for example, like we needed to get the VMware drivers running. We need to get the VMware tools like user mode code running. Uh, I was using GVim and so we wanted that to execute. Uh, C, the Microsoft C runtime code we wanted that, and also optionally some uh, some PowerShell code of, of my choosing that I didn't want to be subject to uh, constrained language mode enforcement. So this comprises everything that I would like to include into my overarching policy. So the layout of uh, WDAC tools is as follows. We're going to want to organize our policies like so. Okay, so there are multiple directories here. Uh, the first worth mentioning is base policies. So this is going to be where our uh, specified base policies will be. And what I want to specify for my base policies are the default Windows policy, right? Like allow anything signed, uh, allow anything that's Windows signed and the Microsoft uh, block rules. Now, I believe the intent behind base policies is those that are not 
uh, updated too frequently. Um, I mean, J Jeffrey, uh, who, Je Jeffrey's here, who happens to be a, a PM on, on that team at Microsoft, could, could maybe um, correct me. But that's, that's at least how I work with base policies under the assumption that I don't want to change them too much um, because uh, there are supplemental policies that you can use to, well, supplement base policies. And so the way I kind of view those is like, perhaps those can be the things that are more in flux that are updated more frequently to, to supplement the base policy that shouldn't really change so often. Now, slight caveat there. Um, let's see. There is, when you're dealing with um, deny rules, let's see, let me try to find this. Uh, as mentioned somewhere in here, when you have a policy with deny rules, yeah. Somewhere in here. Ah, okay. So supplemental policies expand what is allowed by any base policy, but deny rules specified in a supplemental policy will not be honored. All right. So... I feel compelled to include the block rules recommended by Microsoft into my policy, but the documentation states that I can't have them as a supplemental policy. So I have to use them as a base policy. So Brian, you're saying the way you think about it is base policies are to deny or audit supplemental policies are to allow with more granularity. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, and really any anything goes like this is built with flexibility in mind and in the absence of like clearer guidance it really is up to us who are um, working with these things frequently as to like how we define our respective methodologies to be all right so again these are going to be um, the base policies that i want to specify and then um, what i also allow is uh, if you have any like explicit supplemental policies you can throw them into this directory and then for things that you don't want to have as a dedicated, uh, like neither a dedicated base policy or uh, supplemental policy, um, you can throw them all in here. So my understanding is that you're only allowed to have a maximum of 32 policies deployed. So what happens if you have many uh, like third-party utilities and you have a, uh, a policy XML for each defined application specific um, uh, like rule uh, rule set, right? Like you may have, I don't know, 40, 50 different application specific policies. The way I like to handle that is let's maintain those separate policies and then merge them all together and build a uh, an application specific supplemental policy. Okay. So Jeffrey's saying, uh, we typically segment deny rules into a separate base policy. Yep. Yeah. So that's what we're going to be doing here. And then, uh, allow star plus explicit denies. Cool. And allow only rules are in our other base. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of like that too. Like, I don't know. I, I feel as though it would be kind of dirty to have a single policy that blends allow and deny rules. Um, just from like an auditability perspective, like that's kind of gross to me. Um, so yeah, I like being able to split things out. Okay. So how the heck do we work with this stuff? Um, first, first let's do a little bit of prep. Okay. So what we need to do because we're dealing with uh, multiple policies is we need to ensure that they are uh, using the correct XML, uh, like base policy specification, right? So like this element here, base policy ID, needs to be present in there if we're gonna be using multiple policies, okay? So the default Windows one has it. Now let's look at the MS block rules. This one, 
I'm looking for base policy ID does not. Okay, so we need to fix that. So I'm gonna create a copy of this um, just in case I screw something up. And I think I'm gonna call this, give it, um, what was that? Uh, MS block rules. And we're going to do reset policy ID, I think. Let's go back to our XML. And at the bottom, yep, okay. By calling set CI policy ID info, give the XML path and just supply reset policy ID, it makes it a base policy. And I mentioned previously that the way you know that an XML policy is a base policy, like just based on the XML, is if policy ID and base policy ID match, okay? Another way you can tell is when the, uh, the policy type attribute is applied. I don't believe that this is a mandatory attribute, um, but it's nice to have. Um, so this, this is definitely an, the, the easier way to tell that you're dealing with a base policy versus a uh, supplemental policy. Okay, so, so we got that. Now we, we actually need to still do a little bit of prep work here. Um, just for my sanity's sake, I'm going to cut these out and move them up top. Okay, so we got those there. Um, we can specify version, by the way, to like anything we want. Um, I'm not really too worried about that right now. Um, but as I did state in my documentation, we should be leaving all of the rules out, okay? Now this might seem counterintuitive at first, but we're gonna specify the rules in code and then at uh, runtime, they're gonna be inserted, okay? So we're gonna save that. And then also at the bottom, oh, we do not have, let me just grab it from here. The settings. Okay, so in settings, here we go. Settings, we're gonna call this replace me and replace me because these are gonna be populated in code, all right? And then we need to do that for um, here as well. Okay. And just to confirm, yep, we got our base policy ID and policy ID, those are matches. Good, okay. So um, why don't I just get this started? So I'm gonna drop these policies into here. Okay. And now let's look at the application specific ones. Now, um, let's go to app specific. Now you'll notice that there is uh, this template file in app specific policies. So let's look at that. Um, I really harped on this a lot before that when you call merge CI policy, the very first policy that you specify is important because all other policies that follow get merged into that policy as like a template. Meaning like when you have multiple rules specified, um, the first policy that you specify keeps those rules but all the like signer rules and stuff like all get merged into this policy effectively and then a new policy file is uh is generated okay now um another thing that we're gonna have to do 
is I think we'll do it in code. Well, yeah, we'll we'll come back to this. But um what we should be able to do is just copy, sorry. copy all of these into here, and then they will just get automatically merged into our app specific uh, policy. Now I did recommend in the documentation that like you, you can get rid of all these rules, um, but in the case of application specific stuff, it actually doesn't matter. Um, we also don't have to worry about like base policy ID for all the application specific stuff, but because the app specific policy template is uh, it's going to serve as a supplemental policy. Uh, we do need to be mindful of this. So we're probably going to have to come back to this and update it accordingly to reflect the proper uh, base policy that we want this to supplement. And there's that uh, policy type attribute here indicating that this is indeed a supplemental policy. All right. So let's start working with code here. Um, so here's what I'd like to do. Let's, um, sorry about all my jumping around here. Let's go back to our base policy. <clears throat> I'm gonna close out these other documents. And let's pull this one up. So I want to use this as a a reference for the rules that I want to specify in code. Okay. So let's just copy these over here. Oops. Let's try that again. Oh. Why am I failing? with copy and paste. I think my like key bindings got screwed up somehow. Okay, all right. <laughs> Computers are hard. Okay, um, so I wanna, let's see. I would like initially for all this to be an uh, audit mode. So let's see. I'm going to take this one, copy that, and add that here. So this will, um, these are all of the policy rule options that I want to apply to all my policies consistently. Okay. So we're going to start start with that. Okay. Next, we're going to configure our base policies. And so we're going to go to our base policies directory. And you know what, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut off that audit from the file name, it, it just doesn't really make sense to me at this point. Okay. And uh, we only have two base policies here. Okay. So we have default windows and we have MS block rules. Okay. So here I'm just specifying the file names because when I go to build this stuff, it knows to go to the base policies directory to pull these, okay? And it knows that because I'm saying, hey, this is a base policy that I'm configuring, okay? So I'm gonna call this, now here's policy name. This is where uh, it will be populated in the, uh, in the XML. So I'm gonna call this base, base windows policy and then call this one MS block rules. Now, here's where you can specify policy rule options on top of the global ones. 
that were specified. So again, these will be applied to every XML. And then these will be applied to just the individual policies. So I'm just going to go with everything uh, as global for now. Let me make sure I have, let's see, is UMCI in there? No, see, I think I'll want that. And do I have audit mode in there? I think I'll leave script enforcement enabled because I'm not too worried about that breaking any workflows. Okay. Okay, uh, I think I'm pretty confident thus far. Let's keep moving on. Um, in this example, we don't have any supplemental policies. Um, so I'm just gonna move on to the, um, the merged policy configuration. Okay, and we already have audit mode specified. So I'm gonna cut that off. And um, here, because we're specifying merged policy, we're, we're not specifying any explicit file names. All right, because the builder is going to know to look for all XML files in here that aren't the template and then merge them into the template XML, okay? So we'll call this um, app specific policies and here's where we specify the base policy that we want to supplement all right so uh, what I'm gonna let's see I would like this to supplement because these consist of just allow rules I would like it to supplement the base policy that also consists of allow rules so this one okay oops oh yeah Okay, and so what I'm doing here is by simply specifying the name of the base policy that I want to supplement, automatically encode <clears throat> um, policy ID and base policy ID in the template will be updated automatically for you. So you don't have to go into the XML and worry about that junk, okay? Um, I did recall having in here, yeah, just to clean things up. Oops, I don't even have that file anymore. I'm going to close this out because I noticed that in this XML file that there were um, rules left over in there. Okay, so I'm just going to do another quick sanity check real quick, make sure... Um, base policy ID, policy ID are in there. I don't have any rules. The policy settings should be replace me, replace me. And uh, yeah, so far, I think it's looking good. So I think we could maybe build these out. And um, here, instead of like splatting the arguments like I have up, up above, let me just uh, run you through this here manually. All right. So, all right, here's, here's the build process, all right? We uh, specified the policy configurations that we wanted, and now we want to build everything. So specify our common base policy option rules. And note, you get uh, tab completion, um, which I can brag about a little bit because the design of set rule option is garbage. <laughs> Sorry, Jeffrey. <laughs> um, so, like, you have to specify, like, an integer value. And then to know what the right integer value is, you do set rule option uh, help. So it's like, if you want to enable UMCI, like, okay, there it is. So now I have to, like, give it the number zero. Well, like, no, I don't, I, I, I really don't like that. <laughs> so I, I made it so that you can just tab through and uh, 
refer to the human readable values. Uh, and you can supply an array, which should make sense because we want to give it an array of rule options. So I'm going to do that. We give it our base policy configurations. Okay, and we already uh, defined that as an array. And our merged policy configuration. Okay. Now, additional options that will be present are uh, deploy and deploy and update. So we're not going to screw with those right now. What deploy does is it will copy it the, the built uh, binary policy artifacts to um, uh, Windows directory, uh, system32 code integrity. Okay, And then uh, deploy and refresh or deploy and update will also run that um, WMI method that we covered previously to refresh the, the policy for you automatically so that you don't ever have to think about like, oh, what is that god awful syntax for that WMI method, right? So um, I abstract that away for you um, and I built it this way just because it makes my life so much easier. Um, so I feel pretty confident about this now. So why don't we, um, why don't we go for it? So I'm gonna want uh, an elevated terminal here. Ew. So this, um, if you ever run encountered this before, like when you get this like weird copy and paste fail, this usually happens when you're copying stuff like from, from the internet. Um, and like you have like mixed, um, like carriage returns versus like carriage return line feeds, you know, like windows versus Unix style line feeds. So, um, that's always, and it, it's, it's an issue with the built-in uh, PS read line uh, module. So whenever that happens, uh, you, you can do a couple things. Like this usually just indicates to me like, hey, I'm just going to save this to a PS1 and then dot source it. Um, <laughs> only the problem with this is that because constrained language mode is being enforced, I'm going to want to call this a PSM1 file instead. So let's do, um, let's call this build dot PSM one. Okay. And we'll call, we can't dot source in constrain language mode, but we can call, uh, import module. All right. So what did I do wrong here? So policy option strings. Cannot validate argument policy option strings. What I do. <laughs> All right, let's look at the example here. All right. Convert WDAC policy. So this is in, let's pull this up. Um, so that's build and deploy policies. Mm -hmm. And what line was that? That was line 332. All right. So 332. What are we in here? We're in the... Okay. We're in the invoke WDAC code integrity policy build function. 
and we are debugging live here. So base config comes from where? All right, base config, file name, base config. So in base, Policy configuration. Okay. So base policy configuration. Let's ensure that that is actually sane. Um, uh, this is really annoying that this is going to be difficult for me to debug in uh, constrained language mode. So ugly. Well, you know what? No, uh, I'm not going to do this. I am not going there. Screw that. Okay. Um, here's the other way that I fix those carriage return line feed issues. I just um, I cat the file and then ensure that the line that the uh, the new lines are consistent by just piping it to out file uh, we'll call this build 2.psm1 and then close that out okay So now I should be able to just copy and paste this in. Yep, okay. Hmm, okay. Um, I think I, I see my bug here. Let's validate this assumption. Did I assume that optional policy rule options will always be supplied? I, I suspect that to be the case. So I gave it audit mode. So let's um, remove that from the common ones. And uh, if it turns out this is a bug, well, Thanks y'all for helping me fix it. Okay. Well, let's just try it again. <laughs> I'm getting there. Definitely not the uh, intended result here, um, but that's okay. Oh yeah, okay, all right. So yeah, same thing with the merge policy. Um, this is what happens when you don't write unit test people. Okay, let's try that again. Um, and <laughs> by the nature of this being a uh, PSM1 file, you're not gonna get output, is that right? It should have given me some output. Yeah, man, yeah, working with stuff in constrained language mode can definitely be a huge pain. Um, Cause yeah, what it's supposed to output is when it builds properly, um, yeah, Sunny, definitely a good advertisement for, for Pester and writing good uh, unit tests. Um, I'm, I'm hoping many of you might uh, consider adopting this and uh, pushing me uh, a little bit to, to, to write those, those tests. Because uh, to date, I don't have any evidence that anyone else on this planet 
is uh, using WDAC tools for managing their policies. So hopefully y'all will consider it after this. Um, so what I like about the output is uh, for every policy, uh, binary policy that was built, it tells you a few things. So it tells you like, okay, the first policy was a base policy and it's XML is stored here in, uh, in the build artifacts directory. It's binary version was stored here in the, um, and th this is the naming scheme that's required for multiple policies, All right? So this, this comes from the, the policy ID in the XML. So policy ID dot CIP. Um, it will tell you the policy ID and the base policy ID, right? So because this is the base policy, you, as you would expect, uh, both of these would be equal. Um, the policy name, which we specified in code, and then the policy info ID, which was populated automatically uh, based on the, the build date. So Cinco de Mayo, okay? Um, <clears throat> Next, we have our, our next base policy. So as expected, uh, policy ID and base policy ID match. Um, we get the relevant build artifacts. And then for the merged application specific policy stuff, um, that is a supplemental policy, um, which you get more evidence of here. So it has its own unique policy ID, but it supplements the following base policy ID, this one, which we specified was as the, uh, the base windows policy, okay? Um, so we haven't deployed this yet, and that's kind of what I wanted um, so that we could just like manually do a, a sanity check of things here. So um, when you have application specific policies, um, it's going to copy over the app specific policy template. Um, but really the one that is going to take effect is the merged policy. Uh, that is my, my understanding. Here, let me, uh, delete everything here and run it again, just as a sanity check. Yep. Yeah, so that just gets copied over. And the reason it gets copied over is because um, the base policy ID and policy ID in this XML are modified. And you wouldn't want, um, like it, if you have your stuff like uh, in change control, you don't want to modify the, the XML of app specific policy template. So what I do is I copy it over to build artifacts and then I update it in there because um, build artifacts, like you can do whatever you want with it. Like presumably you would include these in like a separate change control uh, process, right? So um, when everything is merged together, the application specific policies, what results is merge policy.xml, which is indicated in the output here, okay? So Sonny's question is, why is merge policy.xml smaller in size than MS block rules? Uh, well, because MS block rules has like a ton of the block rules, right? And um, the merged policy consists of these application specific policies, which honestly are like not that large in size. So, you know, that's, that's why it's, it's a little bit smaller. Okay. So we can look at, uh, build artifacts, check out the merged policy. So this is our application specific supplemental policy. And it appears to have inherited all of the rules that we specified in code, right? So inherit default policy. Yep. That's in there. I mean, yeah, we could like manually check this stuff. U, uh, UMCI is that in there? Yep. Um, sure thing. Yep. Yeah. So it is there. Um, like I'm confident things are looking pretty good now. Um, ideally, like if you're doing this deployment, like for the first time ever, 
um, you'd want to like manually check all of this stuff just as like a sanity check. Um, yeah, so Sunny, your question is merged is base plus application specific or just application specific. It is just application specific in the form of a supplemental policy where that supplemental policy supplements a base policy. Does that make sense? So I managed to, okay, that does make sense. Okay, cool. So yeah, it, it is, they are separate, but they supplement the base policy that I specify, okay? Um, so why don't we, why don't we go deploy this? Okay, do it live, deploy an update. So no, uh, no junky XML or sorry, uh, WMI method invocation needed. Okay. Um, now this output here is going to indicate that it was deployed successfully. Um, and if you don't get any error when you specify deploy and update, um, the absence of an error will indicate that the policy did refresh successfully. So now if I wanted to do like get WDAC code integrity event for users, for like user mode code, since last policy refresh, am I gonna see any events? Yes. Oh, found another bug. Okay, I should take notes here. So my resolved file path did not uh, did not resolve properly for some reason. So I will uh, I'll get that fixed. And the other issue was. Um, this ah. I'll get those updated and fixed okay <clears throat> here despite the uh, the issues so it looks like let's see what is my oldest rule here did I screw something up probably yeah I mean <laughs> definitely looks like I screwed something up here oh I bet I know <laughs> I didn't properly um, I will put money on me not properly updating my block, my uh, MS block rules policy to have an allow all rule in it. What do you think, Brian, Jeffrey? <laughs> you think that was my, uh, my screw up? Okay. Yep. I'm pretty sure. Okay, so uh, you may be asking, what am I talking about? Um, so in this article here, when it talks about um, base policies, all right, let's read this. For any execution to be allowed, the application must pass each base policy independently. See you, Jeffrey, take care. Thanks for joining in. Base policies are used together to further restrict what's allowed. For example, let's assume a system has two policies. Well, uh, fortunately, in this case, we do. Base policy A and base policy B, okay? Uh, which we have policy A, policy B. With their own sets of rules. For foo.exe to run, or what? <laughs> These legitimate uh, Windows binaries, <laughs> we'd like to run 
Uh, in order for them to run, it must be allowed by the rules in base policy A and the rules in base policy B. But the default um, uh, format of the Microsoft recommended block rules does not have a, uh, an allow all rule in it. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it is not really designed to work with uh, multiple policies. I think the intent was like to merge that into a policy, but since we're trying to avoid that, um, we're, we're gonna have to fix that. So um, the simple solution would be to just steal and allow all rule. So I'll go to C Windows schemas, because I know there's an allow rule in there, uh, and allow all rule here in example policies in the allow all policy. Okay, so let's steal this file, file rule and go back to MS block rules. And go, go, go. Okay. Okay, so we'll put that allow into file rules. Oops. Okay. Okay, and um, how is that referenced in here? Okay, it's in file rules ref. Okay. You know what? Let's do it. Let's do those two, two uh, identical allow rules with distinct IDs, one for the driver scenario and one for the Windows scenario, just to just to cover our bases. Okay, now these are in uh, file rules ref section down here. Okay, and so we'll just copy this and paste that in there and copy this allow all rule into the user mode scenario. All right. <laughs> Sonny's saying the WDAC documentation is a mystery clue, not a guide. Uh, I, I will not disagree with you there. <laughs> so if I seem confident about how to fix this, um, it's through the results of debugging this issue. Only when I ran into this issue, uh, I wasn't intelligent enough to first enable audit mode. So <laughs> uh, I was in enforcement mode and then when I refreshed my policy, all of a sudden when you start blocking uh, like Windows system binaries from executing, bad things happen. And it's a challenge to recover from. So learn people from my mistakes. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was a bad day, bad day. But I recovered it and I learned from it. So win-win, all good. Okay, so let's, let's try this again. Um, I think all I have to do is call that. Okay. Cool. I mean, we didn't get a sea of errors. Um, this is still potentially <laughs> problematic. Okay, so MS block rules is saying that this is not allowed. All right, let's, um, let's dig into this again. All right, so it's saying that this file, just as an example, wbmprox.dll would have been blocked based on this policy. So let's go in here again and say base policy A and base policy B with our own sets of rules for 
foo.exe, no, wbemprox.dll to run. It must be allowed by the rules in base policy A and the rules in base policy B. So, couple things. We want to ensure that UMCI, well, yes, UMCI we confirmed was enabled in our Windows policy and our MS block rules policy, okay? Um, they're both in audit mode, so that's why things are not breaking horrifically right now. Yet, we still seem to have an issue. Um, let me go back one more time. to the base policies, the, uh, the block rules. Okay, so I need to ensure that this is actually applied properly. Okay, so we have an allow all rule specified in our driver scenario. Um, so Sonny, you're asking, so MS block rules need to be in the main base policy. Yes. Um, again, the reason is because Microsoft says so. Supplemental policies expand what is allowed by any base policy, but deny rules specified in a supplemental policy will not be honored. Therefore, they must be in a base policy. Okay. I would prefer them to be in a supplemental policy. Um, but they can't be, okay? Uh, and we have allow rule two in there. Um, well, let's see. Let me try all this just one more time. And then if this doesn't work, then I have a potential backup plan. Oh, I didn't do deploy and update. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. And another uh, sanity check would be, does this get file hash for that? Okay, so we'll consider that file hash. The hash of this policy, oh, has to be SHA-1 file hash, okay. 2FA. Oh, wait. Um, oh, I thought the policy hash was in there. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to double check in the event log because I could have sworn that the hash of the policy was in there. Maybe that was in the signer info. Well, anyway, let me double check. Ignoring refresh for code integrity policy. Huh. Trying to refresh code integrity policy. Ignoring, trying. Oh, so that's kind of interesting. Code integrity policy refreshed for for five policies. Um, what were the date times? So that was at 3.34. Oh, that was, that was a while ago. Um, let me clear the log. And 
deploy. Grab the events. Let's just grab all the user events, see if we get any. Oh, and we, okay. Uh, I've got putty here, that should not. Wait, why is that blocked? It should be in audit mode. Something is, oh. All right, you know what? Something is screwy here. That shouldn't be enforced. All right, well, here we go. Um, I'm sure those of you who have dealt with uh, refreshing policies, especially when like it's a large change, um, it like Windows taking the change can often be problematic. Um, I think the, the default that like many of us will do will be like, all right, this isn't working, screw it. I'm just gonna reboot two times. And then <laughs> usually it will take. <laughs> um, and that's fair. Um, instead, I'm, this, wor this worked uh, for us last time. Um, I'm gonna take this and we are gonna burn the policies with fire. Oops. Okay. Now, those policy files, I believe, will not be in the code integrity directory. Yep, so SI policy is not in there. Don't delete driver SI policy.p7b, by the way. That's for, um, uh, that has a driver uh, block rule set in there. Um, okay, CI policies active. Those CIP files oh, are not deleted. So, okay. Well, they're gone now. Okay. So we burn that with fire. Now let's try to deploy an update again. So Brian, you're saying that means if you have a main base policy and a separate uh, block list policy and executable that tries to run are checked against both and must pass both. That's why you need allow all rules in your block policy, because if you don't, then everything will be blocked. Very pro problematic. Yep, indeed. <laughs> uh, all right, so that is refreshed. See, it's not supposed to be blocked. So, all right, I'm gonna, well, let me just save this out first and then we're gonna reboot. save that too. Oh yeah, that's on the desktop. Okay. All right. Okay. And we're going to restart. So while we wait, I guess I can apply a little uh, commentary here. Um, this is definitely painful to work with, uh, if you can't tell. Those of you who have worked with this uh, know some of the, some of the problems that, that I'm experiencing. Um, and it gets really annoying. Just the, the inconsistency of it is annoying. Um, my experience has been like these big problems like with things not refreshing are usually the can usually be fixed by rebooting one or two times 
And then just when you have like incremental updates thereafter, uh, you can refresh without rebooting just fine. That's been my experience, um, but your mileage will vary. Um, so what does get to me to this day is still the, the inconsistency of deployment. So um, I wish things were better, um, but we are, we got to deal with what we're given. Okay. Oh yeah, I guess my quick test would be, will putty run? It does, okay. So that's a step forward. Um, let's do this, temp equals. Okay. Uh, putty is launched by Explorer in audit mode. Uh, I mentioned this in a previous stream. Um, every time you do like a broad refresh of the policy, um, you're going to get these uh, native images generated. Just ignore them. Don't try to build a policy to allow them. They're not going to surface again until you uh, update your, your policy. So if you're like doing event forwarding for these events, um, you're just gonna have to build in logic to consistently ignore these. I wish I wish these were never logged, um, but like somehow under the hood, there's like a caching mechanism that takes place. So it only gets logged once at least. So you're not gonna constantly be inundated by these, but just, you know, something to, to be mindful of. In fact, one thing I could probably implement in uh, get w, get w code integrity event that function uh, would be a switch to filter all of these out. That would be nice because I find myself like just having to weed through all these things, and uh, and it, and it's kind of painful. Um, so cool. Uh, we don't see like a sea of things being denied. So that's good. Um, I like that. So now what if we tried to refresh our policy again, just, and then see if none of those NI events surface. Oh, so Brian, you, you complained about that same thing uh, to David on the WDAC team, and apparently it's on the backlog to fix as well. That'd be great. I would love, love to see that. Oh, I didn't actually uh, deploy an update there. Uh, oh, let's launch putty, pull those events again. Oh, yeah, I, I don't remember like exactly when you will cease to see these. Um, and, uh, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna clear the log and then launch putty. And then we can keep playing along here. Okay. Ah. Oh, um, what? Putty. What is going on? Oh, there's another bug. There is a bug. Uh, 
Um, events are not retrieved when there is no um, policy refresh event. And since last policy refresh specified. So if I do this, that should work. Now, hold up, hold up. Hold up. Putty is not logging. The hell? <laughs> why, 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 why? Oh, yeah. Agreed, Sonny. This is just inconsistent. So we got that. Um, is there a corresponding event? So it looks like it's not wanting to refresh policies. <laughs> um, what if I did this again, the kill policy thing? So like it's not it's not wanting to refresh stuff. Perhaps there's some like caching mechanism that says like hey you've already deployed the same hash so I'm not going to change anything. That could be the case. Um, yeah, I mean, that's probably the case, but, um, but also according to my policy, like putty should not be allowed to run. Yeah. So Should I be embarrassed that this crap is not working while I'm doing it live? No. Like, this this is hard. <laughs> like, I've gotten it to work. Uh, like, on my son's laptop, I've gotten it to work on a server in production. Uh, I, think, I think it was a server in production. But anyway, like, I have a workflow. It all works when it works. <laughs> um, but then, you know, obviously when... Uh, when you try to do stuff live, things happen, things break. Um, I got some great bugs out of this this whole process, um, but you know, this is a uh, from my perspective, this is not a bad thing that things are breaking because uh, you're seeing firsthand how frustrating and inconsistent uh, multiple policy deployments can be. Um, I'm just going to uh, I'm going to restart one more time cuz why not restarting as many times as possible never hurt <laughs> when deploying policies
Yeah, let's watch us fix it. Whether it fixes it or not, I won't be surprised either way. <laughs> You should be using Linux, bro. All right. Um. All right. Um. So I'll do. Let's just try to do this the slightly harder way. Where file path ends with. Okay. So 355. Is that right? Let's see. Well, we can, we can just run again. I think the reason that you're not seeing it multiple times is because it doesn't log it multiple times. I recall this coming up when I was um, doing a blog post on auditing uh, WDAC events for um, finding like, uh, like lull driver tradecraft. And my focus was just on drivers and like I was super annoyed by that. And I think I actually like called that out in the blog. Um, what did I call it? It was like, <laughs> yeah, here we go. I originally scrapped this post because I didn't like that audit events were only logged once per boot due to caching. So yeah, I was ready to give up on the post, but then Casey reminded me that I shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. So, okay, here's my understanding. Oh, hey, Jeffrey, you're back. Okay, thank you. Thank you for confirming that. So yes, you... Uh, WDAC does indeed only log once per boot per block event. Um, okay. I I will accept that. I don't I don't personally like that. Um, just from like a threat detection perspective, like if you're trying to build a timeline around an event occurring. Um, and there were like multiple attempts made for something that like would have been blocked more than once. Um, I don't like that I wouldn't have an accurate timeline around that, but at least I would still have the event. Just, I don't know. It bothers me that like the event that would have surfaced earlier may or may not have been associated with the actual malicious event that's probably unlikely oh okay so you think that if you tried to launch from a different parent process it would log again well let's let's try that so um that was launched from mm, okay let's launch it from powershell so powershell should be the parent process Oops, uh, I gotta filter out putty. Nope. 
I would start. Well, I wouldn't think that would make a difference, but sure, let's try that. Nope, uh, we only get one. So I assume it's just caching by by hash. Um, so that's unfortunate, but it's fortunate in that it explains the behavior that we're seeing. So I would no longer classify this as an inconsistency. It's uh, just a uh, consistently undesirable <laughs> uh, effect which I'll just have to accept. So um, I think I think I've dragged you all through this enough. Um, are there any questions about WDAC tools and using it for deployment? I've certainly learned some things today, found some, some good bugs that I need to fix. Um, and I was reminded of that, of those events only being logged once per boot. Um, so w once I'm confident in my policies and I just want to build and forget about them, like assuming I've worked out all the, all the kinks and like all my assumptions have checked out properly, um, all I have to do is, is just run this and supply uh, deploy and update. And everything like usually just works. Um, so I vastly prefer specifying my configurations and doing my deployment entirely within code in a single basic script that I can have subject to change control versus um, the more error prone process of manually editing XML or using you know the um, some of the built-in commandlets to exit to edit the XML on our behalf. Um, just I know that I would be prone to screwing things up, doing things manually like that. So this to me at least like reads pretty intuitively, and I get the uh, corresponding build artifacts in that build artifacts directory. Um, by the way, you can also specify an alternate build artifacts directory if you don't want to put everything within the WDAC tools directory. Like if you have everything in WDAC tools under change control and don't want to include build artifacts, then you could just save it to a, an alternate directory. But um, I like having everything in one place here. Um, so yeah, let's see, uh, questions. So you, Brian is asking, so you can do policy sets that have policies mixed between enforce and audit, correct? Uh, yeah, Jeffrey confirms that is indeed the case. Um, yes, with WDAC tools, absolutely. So if I wanted, MS block rules to be in, let's see, what would make sense here? If I, yeah, like I could just remove this, assuming that bug wasn't there. Like if I remove this, then uh, this default windows would be in enforcement mode and MS block rules would be in audit mode, so. Yeah, you can absolutely have mixed mode enforcement there. Yep. Any other questions? If not, I think we will wrap things up and uh, you can reclaim your, your evening and uh, wipe your, your brains of, of this stuff for Cinco de Mayo. So um, thanks a lot for joining. I would apologize for the uh, the, the kinks that, that we ran into, but honestly, like every time that I run into these kinks, like um, I view it as an opportunity for all of us to 
uh, to learn and to grow and to also understand what the limitations of the, the, the tools and technology are that we're, we're going up against. So I'm not going to apologize for the, <laughs> for all the, uh, the demo fails here, because I, I think we all learned something and that's, that's great. So, uh, I will leave it at that. And again, um, I, I, I profusely thank all of you for, for your time. Um, it, it means a lot that you would take time uh, out of your day as it means a lot to me that my wife would uh, allow me to, to take time out of my day to, to do this. So we're all in this together and I'm grateful uh, for you to, to join me and to go through this journey with me. So I will see y'all next week. Take care.